Welcome to another episode of the Hoops Fix podcast with me, a host Sam Neat, a full-time British basketball advocate. And on this week's show, we've got another legend in the building, Carl Brown, the first Englishman to ever play in the NCAA Final Four, and obviously the man now behind the Leicester Warriors program. This, like many uh, stories in British basketball, was one of those ones which I knew that he was the first Englishman to have played in the NCAA Final Four, but there were so many parts of that story that I had no clue about, and it wasn't until I did the research and then had this conversation that I truly realised the levels of what uh, Carl has accomplished with his career, and why he should be a lot more appreciated than he is. Um, But yeah, you'll hear all about it in the show uh, thoroughly enjoyable uh, I should say quickly the first 15 minutes the video quality is a little bit dodgy dodgy audio is fine but the video quality the first 15 minutes is fine a uh, bit dodgy before it clears up um, through the rest of the show so shouldn't be too much of an issue as always please go and check out our patreon account uh, that's p-a-t-r-e-o and dot com forward slash h-o-o-p-s-f-i-x there you can sign up to give us a monthly contribution of as much or as little as you'd like to help us do the work that we're doing. Um, we are trying to build an independent media empire and we can only do it with you, the people that listen, the people that watch this show um, supporting us. So please go and check out our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash hoopsfix. As always, uh, if you're listening on iTunes, please take two seconds to give us a rating and review. Literally stop right now, uh, quick, have a look at your phone, find the show, give it a rating, give it a review. Be hugely appreciated. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, leave a comment below, uh, subscribe, all that good stuff. Um, And then finally, if you want to reach out to me personally, uh, hit me up on my email address, sam at hoopsfix.com or every single social media platform at hoopsfix. I reply to every single one or try to. Anyway, that is enough from me. Here is this week's show, episode 56 of the Hoopsfix podcast, Hoopsfix podcast with the legendary Carl Brown. Carl, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited for this one. As I, as I said to you before we started recording, I've been uh, going deep into the the uh, the back paths of Google to find information on, on, on your career, and I found out all sorts of stuff that I had no idea about. Um, <laughs> so I'm really excited to get into it. But so, sort of before we get to the, the obvious stuff, I I'll always like to start at the beginning um, and kind of go back to the early days of, of what actually ended up making you pick up a ball and start playing the game in the first place. I think what it was, I was a a football player and I played on the same uh, junior football team, Blabian Weston, as uh, Dion Dublin. Obviously, he's had a he had a very good professional career and he's, you know, he's on uh, Homes Under the Hammer on TV and he does a a lot on there. So, you know, good friend of mine. But it was I just played all sports, you know, back then, you know, sports was something that you did athletics and you know, I did football and basketball. Um, so it's just, just, just doing it. What sort of age were you when you, when you first started playing? Oh, when I first started playing, I was about seven or eight. You know, I, I just, it, it was, I was about seven or eight, but they were, I was kind of a bad kid. I was, I was a street kid getting in trouble with my older brothers. Obviously no internet for TV channels. My parents didn't know what I was getting into. A bit of a knucklehead, but it was, um, Paul James is is from Antigua, like myself, and we went to the same school, boys' school, and he was a very good basketball player. His two brothers, his twins, Edwin, John James, and a guy named Peter Walker, who's no longer with us. These were guys who were a lot older than me, went to the same school, Moat Boys, and I looked up to these guys, and it got you off the street, and it channeled my um, my energy. And I'm assuming at some point you had to make a choice between whether you're going to pursue the basketball or you're going to pursue the football thing. Like, how did you make that decision? Kind of, what at what point did that that sort of come? Um, it came. It it came when I was um, 16, finishing school at 16. I had choices to make. I was a very good football player. I had um, a, what call them apprenticeships now with a uh, Leicester City one team, Notts County, Notts Forest, and Ipswich. But back then, football was very racist. And you'd go on a YTS scheme getting £10 a week, but you'd clean boots. But it was there was so much racism within football back then. And I just felt basketball. And I didn't know. I was 16 parents worked all the time. And I just felt more comfortable with basketball because I had a choice of signing uh, an apprenticeship contract or going to high school in, uh, in, in Florida in Homestead. So um, it was... The Leicester, as, as we call them now, the Leicester Riders, the coach back then, Joel Fonari, came and pitched to my parents, who didn't have much money. 
that he would like me to come to, to had an opportunity to go to high school in Homestead, Florida. And um, the rest was history. I was I was going to say one of the things that I couldn't I couldn't find uh, was full clarification on what happened with high school, kind of where you went um, and how that all came about. So it was actually through the Leicester Riders head coach at the time that had seen you and I assume yeah. saw that you were talented and was like, oh, do you know what? I think you could pursue this. Let's try and find you a high school in the States. Yeah, well, what it was, I uh, one of my workout regimes, I'd be on the park every night uh, on the park called Victoria Park. And... This tall guy, uh, American guy, was just watching me play on the park. And as soon as I finished, he just started speaking to me, introduced himself. He'd heard about me. And he just said, look, you know, I've got a perfect situation for you. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, 15-year-old uh, kid. Um, I just said, yeah, you know, speak to my parents. My parents didn't really want me to go. I didn't know that at the time. But, you know, they persuaded my mother and father that I had a talent. But also, because at that time, at 15, I was involved in gangs. I was involved in getting in trouble. When I look back, it was the, the best thing that could have happened to me because I could have end up, ended up in jail. I could have ended up uh, dead. I could have been ended up on drugs like a lot of my other friends, you know, looking back. So it was a blessing in disguise, really. So what age did you actually leave to go to the States? 16. As soon as I, as soon as I finished school at 16, I... Um, I I went to uh, to Homestead, Florida, a, a high school called South Dade High School for three years. Wow! And how how so, did you how did you find that transition? Obviously, you know, you're going from Leicester to 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 the states. Uh, I guess both on and off the court, there were some pretty big uh, cultural differences and and changes. Oh yes, the the first thing was 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 the accent. Everybody wanted to hear my English accent. You know, or they thought that you know that we drank was tea <laughs> and crumpets. But it was a, it was a, a real real culture shock because coming from coming from England and going to the states, it was and I'm looking back. You're going back many years now. It was for me being away from from my mother and father, all my friends. It was really lonely. I was when when I look back, I was isolated, and the only the only good thing I had was obviously the basketball and studying. So. Because when you you first I first got there I think it was like August time, the basketball season didn't start till I think November, so I was just studying, watching high school football, and just getting to know the place. And for me, it was a culture shock, and it was, it was quite it was quite a, a culture change and shock. Did you find that uh, on the court, like when you finally did get to practicing and stuff like that, did you find there were big like? Were you, uh, did you find it a difficult transition to, like, did you find you, you had the talent and actually it was okay? Or did you find, oh, this is, a, this is the way they play here and the style is very, very different to what I'm used to? Well, it, it, was, it was totally, totally different because coming from England, they thought we just played soccer, as they would say. <laughs> so to be English um, and a foreign player coming in to play their sport, I had no respect. You know, I got into a, a lot of altercations on the court. But it, it, it was it was a lot more quicker. They were they were faster than me. They were quicker than me. They was more athletic than me. That my saving grace was was my my work ethic and hard work. Because I played football, I had the stamina, and I had the footwork. I thought I had the ball handling skills and the basketball skills. But it took me about four to six weeks to get up to speed. But fitness wise, I was okay, and it was it was it was very very difficult. When you're talking about, uh, you know, your sort of generation um, at that sort of time, you know, did you know of other English guys that were going to high school that were sort of making the transition from, from England to the States? Or, or were you kind of just out there on your own, just like we're just thinking, oh, I'm just doing this. I've got no idea whether anyone else is trying to do it or, you know, all that well, kind of stuff. Yeah, because there was no no social media. No, and coming from little old Leicester, nobody actually knew who, knew who I was. So um, I'd got cut from every England team and uh, regional team. So coming up at, at 16, I was good in my area in the Midlands, but nationally nobody knew who I was. So when I went to the States, it was just me. I didn't, the only, the, I didn't know anybody that was in high school that was English because obviously there's no TV, where there's no internet, there's no real phones. Everything's done by air mail. So um, I just thought it was just me and I just concentrated on myself being in a, a small hick town 
in uh, in Florida. So it was it was very very difficult. How often were you able to get back? Like, was it a case of during the summers or Christmas? Sometimes you'd be able to get come home, or were you just there? Like the moment you went over there, you were there for three years or whatever until you went to college. Well, it it, it was. Uh, I got there in I think it was in the August September time, and I I couldn't. I was my my parents didn't have any money, and they couldn't they couldn't afford things. So I only got to get I only got to get back every summer. So every summer, I would go back and. Um, obviously money was saved up to to get me a flight back and that's when we had a two month summer holiday so the, obviously schools in the states finished earlier and then I came back and then when I came back to Leicester and I started playing I could see the difference between my play and uh, the, the play of players in my area the top players because I was head and shoulders better than them uh, we, we'd go at it every Saturday at my old school We'll go at it on the park. And, you know, players were always trying to beat me, but I made sure that I let them know that I was the best player in the area. So, and I was, what, 17? And I was, you know, quite cocky back then. <laughs> well, what do you attribute, well, what do you attribute the, uh, the sort of the, the speed of development of your game compared to your peers? You know, like, what is it that you were getting in the States that they weren't getting whilst they were staying in England? I think I think what it was it was just my drive and determination. I would I would um, work out any time I could get to work out. I would work out when high school would finish. I'd go running. Um, after I'd finished running, I would get on the bus for about an hour and go and play street ball on the park every night. And then I wasn't getting back. I was I was getting the last bus back. So I was always playing with older guys. I was always searching out where basketball was playing on the parks, uh, getting embedded in that culture, playing with better players. And when you're that age, you, you actually don't know what you're doing. I just did it because I, A, it made me feel good um, just for the love of the game and just being around people because um, maybe youngsters now will be able to relate to this. But when I was there, it, I didn't actually have, when I look back, I didn't actually have friends. It was, it was quite lonely. And basketball was like, was like my partner. So the basketball was something that, you know, I loved. I wanted to be around all the time. And that made me feel whole. You speak about work ethic. We kind of hear a lot of uh, comparisons between the older generations and the newer generations. And now, you know, you're involved with, with a load of coaching at all different levels. Uh, you see a lot of kids coming through. Do you feel like work ethic is something that might be missing a little bit more from today's generation? Or do you feel that actually there's still, you know, a bunch of players that are working just as hard as you guys were back in the day? Yeah, I I, uh, I keep, I think because of this last dance, we keep looking at generations. All generations are different. And I think now technology, you have all these individual coaches. We didn't have that back then. I think there is the same work ethic. And what it's, it's all about your mindset because a lot of players think, whether it's this generation or my generation, they thought they were working hard. You know, it's not about how many hours you put in. It's what you do within them hours. Because I could tell you, I was, I was doing numerous hours, but I knew everything that I was doing was benefiting me because it was, I, I was battling against myself because my, my parameters were I wanted to be the best on the court uh, in the game on, during that week. So I would always work towards that game. And if there was things that I didn't do or the coach challenged me, because coaching back then was very autocratic and all coaches broke you down. They wanted to see if you had, and it's only now I know it because I'm older, is mental resilience because, you know, coaches would tell you weren't any good. They would beat you down. You know, you had to run after practice. You had to run till you threw up and you couldn't finish until until the the, the slowest player could make it. So you, you was only as good as your last player. So I think, yes, mental resilience is, is, is still great. It is good now. Uh, but people like to compare. But I just think it's it's you as an individual. Do you want it really? And are you going to be honest with yourself? What did a typical uh, week look like for you at high school uh, in terms of your daily schedule? You know, were you getting up early and doing morning workouts? You have practice after after school. Like, kind of, what did the day to day look like? Well, day to day, you had to be up, and we we was at we was at high school for about eight o'clock, and then you had to do you had to do all your classes. And we practiced um, every day after high school. 
So you could get in early to shoot, but we had we had high school practice um, every day, and it's like a short three month window. So a lot of the things that you had to do uh, during the season or even before the season, you had to go and seek out uh, to play on the local parks or work out yourself. And uh, that that that's what I did with some uh, some of my other teammates. And then what? One game a week. Yes, yeah, it was, it was one game a week. Uh, sometimes you'd play two, but mainly it was, well, it was split. It, it was like uh, maybe sometimes two, but um, unless you played in a tournament, obviously that would be over the weekend. But it was, it was usually one game a week. And how, how, good, and how good was your team at high school? And, and also and then kind of in amongst that, in terms of your own individual standing and your own individual performances, like where did you sit? I think our team, we was at a, three, a 3A school. So we, we had the 4 and 5A schools. So for 3A school, when I first got there, we was middle of the pack. Uh, by, and that was that because I went there as a sophomore. So I was there three years. So as a sophomore, we were, uh, our team was okay. As a junior, we progressed. And in my senior year, we won our uh, region and then we went to the state finals which we didn't win but every year we progressed and um, a player that we played against uh, Chris Corciani who played at NT went on to play against at NC State and playing the NBA is still a good friend of mine he was one of the top players within the Miami-Dade area so that's the area I played in there was a lot of top basketball players that came out of there so by my senior year my team was one of the better teams within 3A around our area. But uh, me as a player coming from England, I struggled to get a scholarship uh, after my senior year in high school, even though I had a good um, senior year being a 3A school coming from England. I think I had one letter and it was from Florida International University. And that was it. So, how much do you think? And I, cause I feel like this is a is a, is a theme today as well. Where like the uh, did you, do you think the perception of you being an English player hurt your chances of getting a scholarship? Like, was it a, like, or do you think? Oh, you know, they didn't even know I was English because I was playing in high school and they hadn't spoken to me before. Like, there there does seem to be a thing where there's a, there's almost a stigma of being from England, where it's like, well, if if he's only doing it in NBL Division One, it doesn't count compared to high school in the states or whatever. Like, do you think being from England hurt you in terms of getting recruited for for college? Uh, I, I think I wouldn't say it hurt me. What it what it was was that when I when I went over from high when I went over to high school from England. Every, I had to show my ID because people didn't believe my age. And this is what happened with a lot of European players. <laughs> so being a 3A school uh, and only having Florida International University, the thing that helped me was, I, it, it, was it was quite funny, it's AAU. I didn't know what it was at the time. Um, I, had, I had a choice of going back to England because I only had um, one scholarship off and it wasn't a full scholarship. So I always remember... I had a phone. I had um, uh, a phone call. A coach got a phone call to say, "Would I like to play on an AAU team?" So I went and played on this AAU team, and I did very well in the summer. And after after the tournament finished, I remember this little guy came up to me and he said, "Oh, my name's Nikita Johnson. I'm from Chipola Junior College. We want to. Have you got any scholarship offers?" And I said, "I had to say, yeah, I've got loads, but I didn't." <laughs> he says, "Well, you know, we're junior college. If you." ever want to come up and visit here's my card so i took his card and the rest was history from there so what you you went and you went and visited like asap like and then and you were thinking yeah this is my shot like kind of what was your knowledge of of junior college and uh and kind of where you were going to go on from that well i, w- I waited till i got back to to high school spoke to my coach coach bronis and i went up for i went up for a visit and ended up signing for chipola junior college which was a a a redneck hick town where you know there wasn't people like me there it was a big cowboy ranches uh where the were where the boosters for uh the junior college but it was the best decision i made because they were one of the top junior colleges in the state of florida did you know that going in no i didn't i, di- I didn't i just all i wanted to do was play basketball and i was just so happy that i had a, a full scholarship where I didn't have to pay, and I could, I could showcase my talents because I I believe that 
you know, by my senior year, physically, and the one thing I, I did, I, I was a very ferocious defensive player, and I was very quick, and I could handle the ball. I wasn't the best shooter, I wasn't the best scorer, but defensively, handling the ball, not turning it over, and being a leader, I think that they were my my qualities, which I which I knew, which well I thought I knew would uh, would would help me. I was going to say, like, you know, what what was it that Chipola saw in you that that other schools didn't? And you, and you know, we know that down the line you ended up becoming known, very well known as a, as a defensive player. Like, was that already pretty evident in high school at that point? No, it was. I, I just think because there were uh, a lot of players make their name during you know, their junior high, high school years. And then you have like your top 20, top 50, top 100. There's no way I would ever have been in there because coming from England, who am I um, playing in, in a league that they didn't think was the, the, the best high school leagues. So you have to take different, different routes. And then it's it, with your determination and drive, you've got to, you've got to try and make a name for yourself. So it's not about blaming anybody. you, you know, it's the cards you're dealt. You try and play them and play them to your advantage, but then let your try to let your game do the talking, really. So, how how much did you how much success did you end up having having at Chipola? Like, I don't know about your freshman year, but I did I did find in your I think it was in your junior year you did you want like win like a regional title, uh, and your numbers were like you averaged like twelve and it's about twelve and nine assists, something like that, twelve twelve points nine assists, something like that. So it's pretty solid yeah. numbers. Like, yeah, kind of recap us your your two years at, at Chipola. Well, well uh, two years at Chipola, my freshman year, um, uh, it was we had we had a lot of Prop Forty Eight students. So I was a Prop Forty Eight student. So I didn't pass my SATs. So junior college back then was the route. You had a lot of top players that went to junior college. So my freshman year, we lost in the semifinals to Dade North, who was a powerhouse nationally. So in Florida, Dade Miami Dade North were the best were usually the best team every year and won it because coming from Miami and uh, uh Dade North had all the players. My senior year, we went and we won uh, our state championship. And I made the all tournament team that year. And then we went on to the nationals and it just so happens we lost, I think it was in the second round to the to Hutchinson Kansas, who were the eventual winners. If we hadn't have played them, we would have got further in the tournament. So from my sophomore year, I was recruited by more or less every team that needed a point guard. So DePaul, uh, Clemson, uh, University of Alabama, Wimp Sanderson, um, University of Florida, Norm Sloan, Georgia Tech, uh, USC, Clem Haskins. And I think uh, Clem is big with uh, Nike. So when there's, there was a lot of Nike, Nike things going on around Europe, well, especially when it was in London quite a few years ago, he would um, always speak to me. So I was recruited heavily my sophomore year, and uh, uh, obviously I chose Georgia Tech. Was it was a Division One scholarship always something that you were aspiring to? Like the, from the moment you went to Chipola, was it like you know I'm going to smash it here for the next two years and then, and then get a D1 look, or was it something that kind of hadn't even crossed your mind? You just like I just want to be, just want to play basketball and sort of be as good as I can be. But my thing was I just loved the game and I just wanted to be the best. I love competing. I want and that and, and, it, and it was it, I think back then because of no social media, it was an innocence. It was yes, I, I wouldn't mind playing in the NBA, but it was the innocence, innocence of uh, competing against other players, being trying to be the best on the court, that camaraderie, it, what you do as a basketball player and then just living that student life. So you got to remember, being 19 years old, 20 years old, you know, you've got the parties, you've got the girls, you've got the, the, the training, you've got the whole social life. But basketball wasn't always number one. So, I, you know, if there was big parties the night before games or people, I would always stay away from that, believe it or not. I was always I was always concentrating on being the best I could be and trying to win because basketball was my sanctuary. That was everything to me. Did you have one eye on being oh maybe i could turn this into a professional career and it could be my living in the in the long term or again was it just very much the innocence and the purity of the love of the game yeah i i think it was the innocence because i i, I always knew i said okay i could always go back to england and play 
but that wasn't something that I was looking at. I just wanted to, you know, enjoy the moment and I just took it day by day. So it, it wasn't until I went to the tournament in Hutchinson, Kansas, that I decided on my five trips after I came back. I was always about the moment. So when coaches would come down to watch our practices and I'd get introduced to them, it, it didn't really phase me because I just wanted to play the game. And I think that was the beauty of it. And I wanted my, you know, just to give my all to my coach. So when the Division One schools came knocking and you, who, who were the five that you, that, you, that you did your visits with and kind of what are your memories of, of the whole recruiting process? Wow. Well, <laughs> the recruiting process, it was crazy because I went on um, University of Alabama. They sent they flew a private jet down to Chipola Junior College. I didn't even know they had, a air, they had an airfield. Um, Wimp Sanderson, uh, no, Clemson. University of Alabama, they sent private private planes for me. I went to Minnesota, Clem Haskins. I went to University of Florida on my visit. And uh, my last one was Georgia Tech. And all five were great. All five were great programs. But um, the reason I, I think I chose Georgia Tech was Coach Kremens, he, he said to me, and you don't get it at the time when you're um, 22 years old. He said, you know, if you come to us, you will be uh, a yellow jacket for life. We will always be there for you. And at 22 years old, you're like, really? You're not even thinking like that. Because a lot of schools, they'll just, you and you know about it now, they'll just use you up. And a lot of the players were were really genuine. They were giving me the feedback of, look, you know, this school will take care of you, coach will take care of you. You know, you'll always be a part of the yellow jacket family. And, that was one of the things that resonated with me. But the main thing was on my visit, they didn't pull out any stops. Um, I always remember David Whitmore picked me up in a beat up Mustang and we, we, we just went out and they took me to some great places. All the other places, it was like you, you're in like a nice car and they're just putting everything on. This was more realistic and the players were really honest and, um, you know, told me, you know, how it would be. Was it, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned that your parents initially, you know, couldn't have been that involved because they were busy doing their other things. At that point, when you're making these massive decisions and deciding which school you're going to go to, and obviously in the States, you're kind of a big deal at this point. Like, I, I, there, was a, there was a graphic that I picked up. I think it was a some type of trading card which spoke about, you know, when you came from Chipola, you were ranked top 25 in the nation as, uh, of, Juco, of Juco players. So you were kind of getting all this attention and stuff. Um, and then... Obviously, in England, there's a whole other world. And your parents, I, I would assume, maybe I'm wrong, but I would assume your parents didn't know that much about basketball or weren't that involved with basketball. Was that difficult trying to explain to them the kind of what exactly was happening, what was going on, the, the magnitude of it? Yeah, so my parents didn't have a clue. You know, it, it was... I would speak to them about um, where I wanted to go, but I would speak to to my coaches so from the junior college, I speak to Nikita. I'd I'd speak to because my my um, junior college coach was one of the all time all time great coaches. So I just wanted to go somewhere and just play, and and that's why I chose uh, Georgia Tech. And being the top twenty five rec- being a top twenty five recruit, um, that's why uh, those Division one coaches were taking junior college players because that was a uh, I didn't know at the time, but I was a stopgap for Georgia Tech because the following year, the the best player, one of the best players ever to come out of New York, Kenny Anderson, I didn't know that they'd already done a letter of intent. So I was supposed to be a stopgap for one year and not play my senior year. And that, you know, that's another story. Yeah, I was going to say that uh, there was one there was one article that I I, I ended up uh, digging up articles on. I think it was like the Orlando <laughs> Sentinel, some type of newspaper. Where unfortunately, it's now yeah. blocked. It's blocked in Europe, so I had to access it via proxy, as if I was I was looking at it from the states. <laughs> but one of the things there was a quote in there from Kremins where he he was saying that. He was, for some reason, he was shut out from recruiting high school seniors. And that was why he ended up looking at junior colleges. And that was the only reason that yeah. you and Johnny McNeil ended up getting yeah. recruited uh, just by yeah. chance. And he's like, obviously, it's worked out really well for us, but it wasn't an intentional thing. People say that I'm recruiting genius. Yeah. And it's just like I completely lucked out, which is just crazy. 
Yeah, and that's the thing. A lot of Division One, a lot of Division One schools wouldn't wouldn't take a chance on junior college players because the M O One junior college players were we we wouldn't go to class. We didn't know how to run plays. Um, we were we would be we would be problems because top schools back then, which is and this is just generational thing. Back then, the ACC was one of the top two leagues in the states, so they would get all the high school top All American players. Junior college wasn't something they did. So Coach Kremers did look up. And I guess what he did, he looked at our DNA and what me and Johnny McNeil did at junior college. And one thing we did, we were very, both of us were very good defensive players. Um, Johnny McNeil was a very good rebounder. And we didn't, we didn't look to score. We, we were not big scorers. We were team players first. So looking back, Coach Kremens, he would only recruit two or three scorers and everybody else had to work around those players because these were the players that would be catapulted to the NBA. Dennis Scott, the Brian Olivers and the Kenny Andersons when you when you look at it. Was there an awareness um, from the basketball community in England about, you know, you and what you were doing in the States and kind of look at how getting recruited by all these huge schools or was it very much, I mean, I guess without the proliferation of the internet, it was difficult for people to know you were very much just on your ones, just getting on with it. Yeah, I was, I was just on my ones and I have to um, give a lot of credit to bless him. Uh, you know, Jimmy Rogers, who's not with us anymore. When, when I ke- did come back to England in my twenties and I uh, met with Jimmy Rogers, met up with Jimmy Rogers, he was the one who was, you know, talking about my name throughout basketball because he would get all the Pontel videos. And he was the one who told me, he says, Carl, he says, you don't even know this. You do know you're the first ever English player to play in the Final Fours. You've created history because Jimmy Rogers would follow all the college basketball and he would get his tapes maybe, I don't know, uh, every other week. So he was a historian on the English guys that went to the States and he could tell you, you know, which players were which. So I have to give Jimmy Rogers a lot of credit for giving me the history of and enlightening myself on my own career. Because when you're embedded in that career, you're not really worried. You just want to play. You just want to win. You just want to have fun. And you just want to, you know, just just be in the moment. So stepping onto Georgia Tech campus, kind of what, what are your memories of making that transition from Chipola to, to Georgia Tech? And uh, yeah, what your sort of first impressions were and your early memories? Well, ATL's like, Atlanta's like a second home. It's a, a great music city. It, it's a great sporting city. And, the, the, you know, the, the Hawks weren't the best team back then. But on the Hawks, you had Dominique Wilkins, Doc Rivers, and... They embraced us because Georgia Tech at the time, especially on our final four run, we was the biggest basketball team within the city. So, I mean, walking onto the campus, it was just uh, amazing with the dorms, the, the how big it was, you know, the just just everything, the classroom, the lecture theaters, the people, the, the, the training table where you went to eat, the physio room. The, foot, the, the, the football, the American football pitch, just everything was just, it was just amazing. And it was uh, so eye-opening. How much How much uh, was tuition, like r- roughly was tuition at Georgia Tech in terms, obviously you got a scholarship, but I'm saying like how much did you save yourself from getting a scholarship to a school of that, of that size? Uh, well, that's a great question. I mean, I don't know back then, but um, I would say you're looking at, what, $250,000, $300,000? Yeah. Crazy. I think. And, and the rest, because we would get, not only would we get full scholarship or books, um, anytime we went anywhere, we'd get our per diem. Um, in the off season, you know, we, we would get our, our training table money. So we would always have, and we would always be taken care of, whether it was with uh, equipment from Nike, uh, whether it was with food, everything else. So the scholarship would have been, uh, would have been a lot. We didn't want for anything. So that... Um... The, I've obviously spent a lot of time looking at the your senior year, which was the final four run. So your junior year, your first year there, kind of how, how did you guys do? Kind of what was your performance like on the court? Oh, uh, if I'm honest, it was terrible because <laughs> you know junior, ju- it was terrible. Junior college, um, it, it it was a step down from you, you're talking about Division One ACC playing against 
NBA players. So you got like the Shaqs, the Steve Smiths, uh, the, 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 uh, the Dennis Scott. There's so many players that um, uh, th- that were on a level which I didn't even know. So coming from junior college, my junior year, I was getting the ball stolen from me. I was a step slower than everybody else. The, the, the amount of practices we had, the level of practices, the level of detail, the level of commitment, and everything for me was just, it, it, it was just mind-boggling. And I was thrown into the starting lineup straight away. And I think after 10 games, I think coach put Brian Oliver, the two guard, he had him starting at the point because, you know, I was nervous. I was making mistakes. I was second-guessing myself. And uh, if, if I'm honest, I, 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 that's the first time I, I started doubting myself. Really? Was there was there a, yeah. was there a particular moment that was a kind of like a uh, a welcome to the ACC moment that you remember that you're just like wow this is just a different level. The the, the first game, you know, the, the first game. Uh, uh, defensively, I was fine. It was offensively running the team, having to protect the ball, and it was just the the the, the first game I played in uh, in our preseason tournaments. It was uh, just eye opening, and plus our practices were crazy. I'm going against. You know, Tom Hammonds, who was an NBA draft pick. And I'm going against guys who are a lot, a lot stronger than me and, and a lot quicker than me. And it took me, I would say it took me my my junior year, probably that whole season, well, half that season, to get up to speed with um, the ACC. Do you feel like the coaching staff, Kremins or, or anybody else kind of ever lost faith in you at any point? And started yeah, thinking, you know, we, we we took a punt and maybe we made a mistake with this one. <laughs> well, well, I know Coach Kremers did, and and this is why where you know I call him my second father. Um, uh, after my well, Kenny Anderson was coming in. My uh, it would have been my senior year, and Coach Kremens, you know, after my junior year, thought I would have been a problem with Kenny Anderson being there, and he tried to um, transfer me. He wanted me to redshirt or transfer uh, to the University of Florida. And when I got wind of it, uh, I, I was so upset. I went into coach's office. I gave him a, a few expletives, uh, told him about himself and left. Because I, when I heard it, I, I was just so upset. And I said, well, if they're going to transfer me, and this was my brain at the time, I, you know, just me as a player, very high, highly strung. Um, I said, well, if, if they're going to get rid of me, I'm going to I'm going to vent my frustration, tell him about himself. Went in, and to his credit, he let me um, say what I needed to say. I banged my hand on his table, showed him, you know, how upset I was, and I left and went back to my dorm room. But my saving grace was Coach Kremen's best friend, uh, Coach Kevin Campwell. He was the assistant coach. He came to, I always remember, he came to my dorm. I was upset. I could have been even crying. He says, Carl, listen to me. He says, we, we're going to need you next year. We're going to need you next season because Kenny Anderson is not a good defensive player. If you can play a backup role, and I'm going to speak to coach, you will be vital to our team. You just need to realize that. And it was Coach Campwell who who made me realize that I didn't need to transfer because I was looking at University of Florida. I didn't want to transfer because Atlanta was a great place. I had my teammates and um, there was a very good recruiting class coming in. It was Kenny Anderson, All-American, uh, Malcolm Mackey, All-American, Daryl Barnes, Ivana Newbill, and a guy named Matt Geiger who obviously went on to play for um, Miami Heat. So we had a very, very good recruiting class. So I decided to stay. I knew my work was going to be cut out. And uh, my the start of my senior senior year was very interesting. <laughs> why 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 do you least. say that? What was it that was interesting about it? Well, the interesting thing was, you know, I I'd had a reprieve. I'm going to be on the team, and um, always remember, Coach Kremins. We had a team meeting, and he said we're going to have curfew while training's going on. So we had to be in our rooms, lights out by, I think it's by about eleven or twelve o'clock. And no booze in the room, no drinking. Obviously, you know, um, we waited a couple of nights. Nobody came to check our, our, our curfew. So me and another one of my teammates, he'll, he'll rename, rename nameless, 
we were sitting, we had a six pack of cheap bush beer, kicking back, just talking, doing nothing serious. And uh, Bruce Dalrymple, the assistant coach, comes in because we didn't lock our, usually we'd lock our dorm door, but we'd forgot. And he walked in and caught us with, um, with uh, obviously beer in the room. And he said, don't worry, I'm not going to say anything. You better believe the next, the next afternoon, myself and Brian Demolic went into coach's room. We got suspended uh, uh, pre, uh, pre-season. Wow. And when there was, so when there were the news conferences, uh, the reporters like yourself were asking, well, where's Carl Brown and Brian Demolic? And uh, Coach Kremen said, well, they're not allowed to train because they've got academic issues and they're working academically. So we were, at every practice we had to come, we were supposed to do our um, coursework in separate rooms. So and that went on for about three, four weeks. Wow. So interesting time. This was, this was, be- this was start of my senior year before our, our final four run. But that, that made us, you know, co- and coach didn't kick us off the team. He gave me my final chance. And, you know, the rest is history. Was there any part of you like, so uh, was there any part of you that felt resentment towards Kenny Anderson coming in and kind of taking all the minutes? Like, I mean, I know that you, you were basically averaging like 30 odd minutes in your senior year. So it wasn't that you weren't playing, you were coming off the bench. Um, but was there any part of you that like, oh, this guy's coming in like and doing this and I'm, you know, was there any part of you that felt that or were you, were you fine with it? No, no, my, I, I, I'm a, I'm a competitor and, and I was, I, I love the challenge. So in practice, they were the best practices. I wanted to show him that, you know, I'm just as good as him, even though I was, I wasn't. <laughs> so in practices, we, we would battle, we would battle in practice. But the one thing, the one thing with Kenny, he, he's one of the best point guards I've ever seen, but we both helped each other because I knew if I could keep up and guard Kenny Anderson, the best point guard in college basketball, or one of the best, and if he could do his moves on myself, get to the basket, hit his jump shots, that benefited him when we played games. So I looked at it as we're pushing each other. I never, I never looked at it as, okay, I knew he was a, a, a better basketball player than myself, you know, on the offensive end. But I knew defensively, I would get to play because, you know, he wasn't that type of defensive player, even though he was okay. So it was just, it was that battle every day in practice to compete against Kenny Anderson and just to let him know that I can play. And, and, you know, we both earned each other's respects. So going into that, that senior year, um, was there a lot of hype around the team? Like, was there an expectation that you were going to have a magical tournament run or was it a case of you actually exceeded all expectations? Yeah, we exceeded all ex- expectations because after our junior year, we uh, we didn't do well. I think we lost to Texas in the um, in the NCAA tournament. I think it was in in the second round. So um, proje- we weren't projected to to do anything really. And the biggest thing was was that Dennis Scott, our best player, he was overweight. So the, one of the criticisms for him was that would he be would he be a high NBA draft pick because he always, you know, in the off season, his weight would balloon and he would put on like 20, 30, 40 extra pounds. But after our, our junior season, we, the whole summer, Dennis Scott, he, and I've never seen one before underwater. We had to do underwater weighing. So, so when you're doing your fat test, we had to do all these tests and we went on all these diets. Dennis went on this serious diet to where he came in his senior year in the best shape of his life. He was already a great shooter, ball handler. So um, when we started out, uh, we played in a thing called the Koppenheimer Classic. It was a, a tournament and we won it easily. Then we played in the Big East ACC Challenge and I think we beat Connecticut and Dennis Scott played well. So right from the beginning of the season, I'm guessing Coach Kremers could see with Kenny Anderson, Dennis Scott, Brian Oliver, these are going to be three NBA draft picks that we, you know, we were going to be okay. And they were your big three, right? Ended up all averaging over twenty points a game that season, and kind of, and yeah, and dominated, right? Like, what are your memories of the before before getting to to the, to the actual tournament? What are your memories of, of of the regular season and going through that? I, I think where why we were so so good as a team. People talk about chemistry and family and camaraderie. 
we were tight off the court. We all had our different personalities. If somebody would get out of, out of line, we'd bring them back into line. We did have, you know, things that happened off the court, but stayed within within the team. But we made sure that we challenged each, everybody, each, each of us on and off the court. But every Friday, we would go, we would drive to Hooters for chicken wings as a team. Sounds like a good and, team ritual. <laughs> yeah. So every Friday... You know, you know, unless we had a game, this was, you know, before the season, we would always do things together and look out for each other. And in practice, all our practices were intense. So we already had that 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 family unit and that team bonding. And also we all, we knew who our leader was. You know, our leaders, our leader was Dennis Scott, Brian Oliver, Kenny Anderson. Yes, he was a freshman, but it was Dennis and Brian who were our team leaders and we followed them. And um, it, it was great. Aside from uh, Kenny Anderson, because obviously he was in practice, but in terms of uh, the toughest player that you had to guard at college, who was there anyone in particular that gave you a bit of a hard time that you were like, man, he's just tough? Two. There's two players. I'll never forget. Mark Macon, he was from Temple, played for Don Chaney, and Steve Smith. And the reason they were so tough, they were like six, 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 seven, six, eight. So... Even though you could stay in front of them, they could always shoot over you. So those two were my two toughest. And um, yeah, they they went on to be, well, Steve Smith, M NBA All-Star, NBA legend. And Mark Macon, he did play in the NBA, but I don't think he had that much of a successful career. So NCAA tournament. Um where were you guys uh where were you guys seated going in like kind of what what do you what were your expectations as a team and kind of what was the media saying in terms of what they expect how they expected you to do and then i guess kind of what your memories uh sort of working through the tournament we'll get onto each game specifically in a second well, that's a lot yeah i think um our expectation was just one game at a time you know we wanted to do better than we did the year before uh i think we started out with east tennessee state and uh, they had a little point guard who was, was about five foot six, one of the top scorers in the nation. And uh, it was a tough game. We could have quite easily have lost that. And uh, we beat them. And then uh, we went on to, I think we went on to play... LSU. LSU. So, and, you know, you play LSU... They had a certain in, NBA, future NBA superstar, yeah, right? Or yeah, two, it, in it, fact. It, 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 in New Orleans, you know. And um, they were supposed to beat us hands down. You know, you got Shaquille O'Neal, Stanley Roberts, uh, Chris De Chris Jackson, who's a lean scorer. In, he's averaging close to 30 points a game in, in college or tw 25, 26. So I knew I had my work cut out, but I focused on him. I knew I needed to shut him down when I did get in the game. So the LSU game was the pivotal game for us because um, LSU was, was, was supposed to be one of the top four teams or to come out of that re the Southeast region. The uh, there was the, there's the famous um, Bobby Kremins quote who said like with that LSU game that uh, you know people want to ask about how important Cole Brown is to this team against LSU you know we like uh, against LSU with Shaq and, and Chris Jackson um, you know Cole came in and effectively shut him down uh, and I, I actually I dug up the box score you held him to five of fifteen shooting. So it was a pretty solid performance on the defensive end. Kind of what are your memories about going up against him? Because he he ended up uh, renaming himself to Ma he's Mohammed Abdel Ralph 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 yeah yeah, yeah um, that's right. And obviously you know I think he ended up leaving the NBA earlier. He didn't have a full career because uh, if I yeah. recall correctly, but he he was had all of this hype and you know in, even in the NBA he had a lot of success in the time that he was playing. Um, but yeah, what were your memories of kind of going up against him? Well, I knew when we was playing LSU that um, uh, Chris Jackson, so you got Kenny Anderson, Chris Jackson, I would always have to guard the best um, guard. Um, that, and that would leave, give Kenny his opportunity to play on the offensive end. But I knew for me to help us to win, I would have to shut Chris Jackson down and it wasn't going to be easy. So my thing was, was as soon as he gave the ball up or even before he caught the ball, 94 feet, deny him, be a pest. And the one thing I did every time out, I followed him to his huddle. <laughs> so we'd have a, just imagine, so he'd have a timeout, I'd run with him to his huddle, then I'd run back to mine. As soon as our timeout was finished, I would sprint over and go straight to him. So, and I think I held him, I don't know if it was 10 or 12 points, but I think I held him to his lowest 
career college score. So, uh, and and that did effectively help us to win. Obviously, they had Stanley Roberts. And the reason I came in the game so early, we was down by about 20 points within five minutes. So, coach came to me and, he, and played the small lineup. So, um, Chris Jackson was a hell of a player to guard, but... One of the funniest things is when him when when Dennis Scott and Chris Jackson went to the uh, NBA draft. Uh, Chris Jackson said to Dennis, "said Man, I'm, I'm I'm glad I'm getting rid of getting that going into the NBA, getting getting away from that crazy Englishman. Where is he?" And then him and Dennis just had a laugh. So, you know, it, it's uh, it, it, it's fond memories. When you talk about your your defensive skills, one of the um... I mean, like, yeah, I mean, the, the question is, where do you think they came from? But what I was going to say was that one of the articles that I read from that local Orlando paper was, was it, it almost attributed it to your early soccer skills giving you nimble feet. And then that's what kind of gave you the defensive quickness to slide in front of players and stuff. Kind of what do you attribute it to and where do you think your defensive skills came from? Yeah, I think definitely it was, uh, it was, it was the football because obviously we use both feet and football. We can run for days. And we change directions, we pivot, and it's like transferable skills. And so to slide and drop step, these were things that I, I was used to doing. So it was it was definitely the football. And then also I ran cross, cross country when I was in, in school because that's one of the things we had to do. So fitness wise, um, going onto a basketball court is short, short movements, but my footwork I had no problems keeping in front of players. So that that was uh, very much attributed to the football, my football background. How much do you think def good defence is about desire as well and actually really wanting to get it done at that end? Yeah, I think, you know, you talk about uh, generations and eras and it's the same now as back then. A lot of players didn't like playing defence because, you know, players want to score. They want to do, they want to do the fun things because defence was something that, always went unnoticed. So you don't see it in the stats because everybody wants to know who scored the 20 points and who's done this. And defensively, I knew the only how I would be able to play on the team, I had to do something that nobody else wanted to do. So I focused in on defense and I took pride in somebody not scoring them. I took pride in holding somebody underneath their scoring average. And I took pride in a player when the game was finished he would have to talk about me because I was a pest and, you know, he had to respect me for, for, for my defense. So A, it was because, you know, I wanted to do it, but B, I wanted to play. Do you think that we would have more uh, English players playing at higher levels professionally if they were more willing to embrace a role that isn't necessarily scoring. Like I, I think there's there, there almost feels like a bit more of a because we're from from England where the overall level isn't that high, especially for junior players coming up. They're used to dominating and being the man, and then all of a sudden you're you're, you're well essentially you're a big fish in a small pond, right? And then you get to to a different level and you realise oh actually I'm I'm not as good as I thought I was, and it's, that's when you've then got to specialise and you've got to become good at one particular thing. Like do you think that that's something that maybe has held back uh, English players at all, or do you think that I'm way off the mark with that? Great. One? Sam, that's a great question. I, I think and and I'll put my coaching hat on um fast forward to you know now i've coached uh, i've been in, I, w I was involved with national teams and one thing with the national team guards or some of the national team players i would butt head with heads with head with them because i would try to get them to play a certain style of defense and when you're trying to explain things to them they, they're not actually ready to listen it was only after they went to the states and I would get a WhatsApp message. Coach, you was right. Can you help with this? The guards are a lot quicker. The coach is on me. He's not playing me because I'm not doing... So, it's it, because they don't... You, you've not been in the situation in England. Because in England, if you're the best player, you can score 30, 40 points. You, you, you know, it's easier for you to play defense. And, it, and, and it's, and it's learnt behavior. And it's, and it's no fault of the coaches here because... And, and, and I'm going on to a bit of a coaching. You've got players who have become coaches like myself and who have the experience of playing at, every, at a lot of levels and having different coaches who have given me my tutelage. And you've got coaches who uh, have done their academics, are very good at what they know. They've, they've referenced it. They've, um, they've tried to implement, implement it with players and that is great.
But when a player has left your program and they go to the States, it's a whole new world. And if you have not experienced it as a player or as a person, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, technically and tactically, that player is left out to dry. And, it, and, and, you know, we talk about generation. It was the same for me. And it was for my mental health. You know, we won't get into that. But when I was in high school, now I look fast forward, I had a lot of uh, isolation issues. But it was I, I focused on basketball and put myself into basketball. That's what helped me. So I think players today, until they go to the States, not all players, because you can see, you know, look at Cavell Bigsby. You know, a lot of players that go over and I speak to them, Afterwards, the coaches only have them playing defense or just use them for rebounding, like a Kingsley or Coro playing at Washington. I'm watching him. He's running up and down the court, and it's for defense blocking shots. But we have more to our game than that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, completely agree. I feel like, yeah, on, on, on Cavell, like, I feel like he's really uh, embracing the role of being bigger on the defensive end and focusing on rebounds, blocking shots. And he realizes yeah. if he's going to have a legit shot at making it in the league, that's what he's going to have to do. Um, which, yeah, again, I, f I feel like there's a lot of players that are just not willing to give up a, a certain aspect of their game um, because they want to do it all, you know? Mm. So after LSU, uh, it was Michigan State, which was Steve Smith's side. Um, and I know yeah. that's the other thing like that run there was a lot of games that were very close right it was like you were getting yeah. winning by one winning by two it wasn't like you were just you know steamrolling over everyone but this one yeah. was a was an OT OT matchup with with Michigan State what were your memories of that one? Oh, that that was crazy I mean the, one of the memories was and I was getting frustrated you know we would get a lead and Steve Smith he he was just hitting every big shot Hit, shooting over me, shooting over Brian, driving to the lane, making the big passes. And it was um, Kenny Anderson at the end of the game who we thought we'd won. We were down. We thought it hit a three. They reviewed it and went into overtime. And I'm, I'm, I think that's the game. It went into overtime. And um, from thinking that you'd won in Georgia Tech and Michigan State thinking that they'd lost, they had a bit of the momentum going into overtime. But um, Dennis Scott, Kenny, we, we, we came through and Ke and Kenny was big that big that game. That was a big win for us. So that, that was Sweet 16. That took you to the Elite Eight, which was uh, Minnesota. Yeah, probably, um, yeah. And they had, who was it, w Willie, was it Willie Buxton? Uh, yeah, Willie Buxton, a guy, I think a guy named Big Rebounding Guy, and I think his name was Ken Coffey or William Coffey. Okay. He was about six nine, six ten. And they were they they were a tough team to beat because the way Minnesota played, they played very good defense, they were very physical, and they were just very well drilled. But then in the end, with uh, Denny, Dennis Kenny and Brian, they they were just too much for Minnesota. And then that put you in the final. Do you remember the, the moment that you beat them and kind of the realization that like, wow, we're we're actually in the final four. Like we've done this. That that, that was that was uh, apart from the LSU game, um, because of we beat LSU, and I I worked so hard. As soon as the game was over, I was hyperventilated. They had to put me on oxygen because I'd used so much energy. I'd use so much energy. So when I went back into the locker room, I couldn't breathe. So they had to put me on oxygen. So from from doing that and then getting to the final four, when we'd won, that to go to the final four, that was one of the greatest experiences ever. So um, going back, flying back to Atlanta, it, there was all it was, it was it was craziness. We we had we had to get off the airplane, go onto the tarmac. And we had to be escorted. The whole airport was packed. We had police guard. We had the whole highway going back to Georgia Tech was just filled with people, people beeping their horns. As soon as we got back to campus, everybody was out. It was madness. It was crazy. Did you get a chance to like celebrate and party or was it, were you trying to sort of remain focused oh. on the next round? Oh, no. The next round was uh, we, we celebrated and party. We was on campus. And one of the things we did because there were certain players that Brown Oliver never drank. He was Brown Oliver, um, our captain, he was not, he wasn't a drinker. So 
we was out partying, whatever, was just enjoying the moment. And it was probably, I would say about one, one in the morning. And I don't know who came up with the idea. Let's, let's go to drive to Coach Cremens' house and toilet paper his house. I don't know who knew where he lived. So there was about, I think, two cars that drove to Coach Kremers' house in this big plush neighborhood and we got toilet paper and we just put it all over his front garden and I think he woke up and uh, he seen the funny side of it uh, and uh, it was uh, one, of the, one of my best basketball moments as a player because the hard work that you've put in, we've not finished yet we've got to the final four and you know we're trying to win it if we can so in the final four, um, it was a matchup with a, a legendary UNLV side, right? The, the, you know, Larry Johnson, uh, Stacey Augman, Greg Anthony as, as well, I think. Um, yeah, Anderson kind of, Hunt. Yeah. So when, when you when you like when did you find out that you'd drawn them, and kind of what was the initial reaction when when you you were facing those guys? When we were facing them, we we were resilient. We didn't care who we faced because you you knew you had to beat the best. And the only problem we had was we didn't have the depth. They had the depth and they had all the money. All those guys were on big contract. But one guy, what a lot of people don't realize, who was Jerry Tarkanian's assistant, was Rob Rugliano. Rob. Rob, Rob. Rob was on the UNLV team. On, on, he was on the coaching staff. The same Rob who... I, you mean Rob who set up Canaries Basketball Academy? Yes, yes. So Rob, that's in Spain. Yes, he and I didn't find out until I met him many, many years ago when I was starting my national team. He said, Carl, you don't remember me, but I was on I was on the coaching staff when we played you in the final four. So and, and that's wow. something that you didn't know. So playing against UNLV, the first half we was up. Uh, second half, we had problems. Kenny Anderson got in foul trouble. Dennis got in foul trouble. I think Kenny fouled out. And then I was at the point. And I was I, I was laid to be, laid bare because I wasn't the scorer like he was. So they ended up winning because they just had they just they put Stacey Augman on Dennis Scott in the second half, and he kind of uh, was a defensive stopper on Dennis Scott. So we uh, we ran out of steam, but it was a great run, and we finished. I think we finished third nationally in the uh, in the in the college poll, which was great. In terms of the size of the crowd that you'd be playing in front of in the final four, do you remember how big it was? Well, the biggest crowd was um, uh, in New Orleans when we played uh, LSU. I think it was about 30,000. I'm not too sure. It was over 30,000 30, wow. plus. It was a lot. It was in the carrier. It was the carrier dome back then. Or it could have been more. It could have been 30,000, 40,000 people. It was packed because it was a big football stadium. Yeah. I think um, uh, when was it? It was in Denver. Uh, and the funny story about that is, and I don't know if you know this, is Coach Kremers went to South Carolina University. Dan Reeves, who was the coach of Denver Broncos, went to South Carolina with Coach Kremens. What Dan Reeves would do for his defensive backs, he would look at taking basketball players, defensive basketball players. I think they still do it now. So Dan Reeves was at our practice. And I thought he was joking. Looking back, he was recruiting me. So he was at our practice. I talked to Coach Kremens, and he had a split second to say hello to me. And he goes, Brown, he says, I love your defense. If you want to come out to the Mile High City, you're more than welcome to train with us. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Anyway, um, cut a long story short, I had a letter to the office um, saying that Denver Broncos wanted me to come to their mini camp. In wow. the off season, when I finished the final four, but we can talk about that later. No, no. <laughs> but, so, but anyway, yeah. So, so I had a, a letter in the office. I looked at the letter and it said, "From um, the Denver Broncos, like to come to a mini camp in in Denver. Um, forgot where in, in uh, what part of Denver it was. Uh, no, in Denver. Sorry, yes. And um, you're invited to the mini camp. And I just put the letter down. I said. I've never played American football before. I'm not doing it. So within our athlete's dorm, one of the big football players, good friend of mine, he said, yeah, I'm going to uh, Denver next week. I've been invited to their mini camp. I'm like, okay. He said, yeah, I'm getting $10,000. So we talking about, I said, yeah, if you go to the mini camp you're, and you've got an agent, you get paid to go. And I'm 22 years old, going on 23. I, I looked for that letter, couldn't find it. Went to Coach Cranston. Coach, 
Yeah. So I've invited to um, the Denver mini camp. Can you get in contact with Coach Reeves? I want to go. Anyway, cut a long story short. They got me an agent. I didn't get ten grand. They gave me five thousand dollars for three days mini camp. And in that mini camp, all the press were on me because obviously being a basketball player coming from England, and Shannon Sharp was there. He was in that mini camp. And wow. so within, so. Within the locker room, we're getting changed. Shannon's like, why are you doing this? You know, you should be doing basketball. I said, well, they're paying me. He said, you know, this is tough, man. You don't want to get injured. you got to watch how you tackle and things like that. And I said, yeah, I will. And the first time I hit somebody, playing defensive back, I hit somebody and I went to them, I'm sorry, and I tried to pick him up. And he laughed. He said, no, you don't do that. He said, that's what you're supposed to do. If you hit anybody, you make sure you, you leave them. And then the other thing is a defensive back, I was trying to watch the quarterback and the ball. So you're watching the ball. You miss it. You're supposed to be watching the player and their eyes. You see, so the, and then these are the things that that I learned. So I did have the opportunity after the mini camp. They wanted to sign me uh, on their, um, it's called the um, development squad. So they would have paid me $75,000. And I would have trained with the development squad for a year. And then they would have reviewed it. But what I did, I came back to Leicester for pittance because <laughs> I love basketball so much. So th th this is one of my regrets. But, you know, it, th that's how it is. Unbelievable. So your first professional gig out of college was actually an American football gig and not a basketball gig. Yeah. Denver Broncos. Yeah. Unbelievable. So. So. OK. So. So that happened. Uh, and you're obviously now thinking, you know, professional basketball career. Did you sign with an agent? Um, did you know that you wanted to go back to Leicester? Like, why Leicester? Uh, kind of what were your options that you were on the table that you were looking at? So, after, after the Final Four and, you know, things settled down, um, spoke to Coach Kremens. I had letters from Miami Heat to come to a, a training camp. So, um, when I got the letter, I said to, I said to Carl, I spoke to Coach, he said, he said, Carl, I wouldn't even, he said, I wouldn't waste my time. I said, why, Coach? He said, uh, if you go to the training camp, there's like, because I think back then there was like 10 or 12 rounds to the draft. There was right. a lot, there's about 10 rounds to the draft. So you would go to the training camp after the draft. And what you would do is you'd just be there just to make up the numbers. So they could cut you after one or two days. Because obviously the, the first, second and third round draft choices, they won't come back until they would have camp. You see? So... I didn't. I kept left, but I didn't even. Uh, I didn't even bother going. And then I got um, Kevin Cadel wrote me. So Kevin Cadel, he was at Kingston. So Kevin Cadel wrote me. He wanted to recruit me to come and play for uh, Kingston. I think called Kingston Kings at the time. And that was so around that season. So if your final four one was nineteen ninety, it was the nineteen ninety yeah. ninety one season that Kingston won everything yeah. and went into Europe and finished top eight and did all the crazy things, right? I think I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm, I'm pretty guessing. sure. I'm pretty sure it was around that time. So, so basically, the top the top team in England at that at that point was recruiting you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and what I did, I I didn't even accept what I did. Um, I think I had a couple of European clubs, but what I wanted to do because I'd been away from Leicester for so long, I wanted to go back home, and so I played. I played for. I think I played for Leicester for two seasons. Yeah, yeah. I played play for Leicester for two seasons, but and this person will will remain nameless. After my second season with Leicester, I think we lost in the cup final. But even before that, um, one of my friends who also played professional had a very good professional career. He said to me, he "says Carl, what are you doing?" He said, "Why aren't you challenging yourself? You shouldn't be playing at that level. You should be looking to play for a top team, get paid." Because it wasn't about money for me. Get paid. Uh, playing Europe so that following year I think I signed with Guildford and we was in there went to Europe so if it wasn't for that conversation and me reflecting and taking stock on my career because well, I wanted it easy I wanted to be the man like a big fish in a small pond it was easy for me practice when I want do what I want I was better than uh, all the other players I could average 20 points a game but when I reflect I'm wait a minute I'm young I need to challenge myself to win championships and play at the highest level I can and to make a living out of it. Because back then I was still living at home with my with my parents. Wow. 
Do you think? So, do, you, do you think so in, in retrospect? Cool. In, in, yeah, in, in retrospect, when you look back on your career, obviously the vast majority of it was in in the BBL. Do you think that you left a lot yeah. of money on the table in terms of your career earnings? Yeah, I I, I think so. Um, and what a couple of my football friends say to me, they say, if you had to do it again, would you have chosen football? I said no, because back then, how many black footballers actually played professionally? They, they, they it, it was very difficult. Dion Dublin had to, he had to go fourth division. I know his story. And, um, you know, our parents weren't adequately equipped to navigate all that. So, um, yes, I did leave money on the table. But you, you know what? What I found out, and this comes with age. I never thought when I retired from uh, basketball that I'd, because I thought it would, it would go on forever. You'd always get paid. That, that's just, uh, you know, and that's a, another story about professional athletes. I never thought that I'd make the same money I made as a professional. But I, I got another career through, you, you know, and it's just, it, it's just crazy. It's a crazy journey. So, you know, I was going to ask about how you found the BBL in general because you, you had seasons where you were averaging 20, average, averaging 25. Like, you had some pretty ridiculous number seasons. Um, you're a seven-time BBL All-Star. Kind of, did you find it, like, relatively easy the whole time? And also, this, this was a period, when you're talking about the sort of the, the, the context of the time, this is a period where, you know, the league was very much dominated by Americans. I remember, you know, the BBL's been uploading all these these retro games to their YouTube channel. I don't know if you've seen any of them, but they, they put up one of the All-Star games yeah. from that sort of era. And it's like, and it's just, it's all Americans. Like the entire, like, I think Steve Bucknell and you were probably, you know, the only British guys that were involved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, and Scans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ronnie. So kind of, yeah, what what your memories of the league at that time, um, what the lay of the land was and how kind of you were, well, how easy you found it or not? And it's no dis and it's no disrespect to the Americans that are in the BBL today. The, the there was more there was more money in back then. You talk about generators, more money that we were getting paid as players. And being English, we always had. It, it was like being in in role reverse or being in the states. We're in our own country. The American players are coming over, and they're thinking that they can dominate us. But the best teams, English teams, were the teams that had the better English players because I'd played at, I, when the American players would come over, not one of those American players had the credentials I had. I played at Georgia Tech. So they played with, with smaller schools because, let's be honest, if you're having to come and play in England, you're not saying, you're not calling them rejects, but you wasn't a top American player. You had to come to try and make your way back to the top by starting in England. So I knew that I was. A, either one of the best two, three, four players on, on the team. So there was always battles with the Americans and then we would become friends because they would try and dominate the English players. I'm like, no, no, no. I played in the States. I've been to the Final Four. I've won the ACC Championship. You know, so if you if you want to try and compare credentials, this is just as a player, you know, let's, let's work together and we can win. And that was the problem uh, with the league back then that, we as English players, we would always have to fight against the Americans. But if you watch the videos, you wouldn't be able to tell who the American and the English players were. And that was the beauty of it, because we were on a, a similar comparison. And um, that, was, that was the beauty of it for me and a lot of English players at the time, that we had to earn our respect and we, we, we played and tried to win and entertain. How did you find that the switch from going from purely, you know, being focused on the defensive end to suddenly being a twenty-point per game scorer in the BBL, like, and having to sort of refine your offensive game or be the man on the man on the offensive end all of a sudden? Well, when I'd come home in the summers, that, that's when I, I would go out all out and score. So, it, it, but to be fair, to be fair, I have to give Billy Mims the credit because. Yes, I was scoring, but until I went to the Leopards, I got recruited. And, um, you know, I think I played, yeah, I played at Leopards when I left Leicester, I think. Yeah, Guildford, sorry. I was with Guildford. Yeah. Then I went to the Leopards and I was playing the point guard. Billy Mims put me to the two. He says, I've been watching your game. He was my, my backcourt running mate of all time is Ronnie Baker. Ronnie Baker. Without him, I wouldn't have averaged 20 plus points. He played the point. I played the two. And we played, obviously played internationally together. He was the quickest point guard 
uh, 94 feet, and I was probably the second. So as soon as we got the rebound, I'd say to Ronnie, I'm going to sprint the lane, uh, pass it to me. I'd either pull up 4-3 or get to the basket. And Ronnie, if it wasn't for him, I, I and I have to say this, I wouldn't have averaged one year. I think I was second leading scorer. I think I averaged about 20, 24, 25 points a game. But Ronnie Baker was instrumental in that, I must say. How many, how like guys like Ronnie and sort of your other teammates from uh, from those periods? How, how much are you in touch with them today, and how much are you kind of like speak and reminisce around uh, about those times? <laughs> I think we. Um, it's not a matter of reminiscing about those times. I think it's. I think that the older generation, we, where, okay, you've got your history, and you have to know your history to move forward. So that's on lock. So without me talk with me talking to you, that unlocks it. Other than that, it just stays closed. We know what we've done, and we're trying to navigate our families, um, our parents, if they're still alive, what we're doing now, our jobs, and trying to trying to um, inspire uh, th- th- a new generation. Because what a lot of young players don't realise is what what their what the history is of basketball. A lot of people don't remember the history. It's only with this lockdown that people are. Oh, wait a minute. We've got a history. Oh, these guys didn't just become old and grey and a beard. This is my lockdown beard, by the way. <laughs> It'll go when the hair cut July the 4th. Anyway, so until we know our history, uh, I don't see how we can move forward with our basket. We've got so much youth, knowledge, experience. And if we could embrace it, work together. I know it's a, a big word. Basketball England various coaches everybody's got their own little philosophies it's not about that look look at the history look at what we have why can't we build on that because a lot of people will say oh england and basketball england is not great we don't have play yes we have the talent yes we have the coaches but we're not working together and it's, it's, it's only my humble opinion so for me i think the future can be bright but i only unlock it when a lot of younger players, they'll say, oh, I've seen some stats on you in the BBL. You was wicked. Why don't you post it? I said, why Why should I? You know, it's not, you, you see, it, it, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it, it, I think it's like with um, the GOAT debate. And I love what Michael Jordan does. He never, you should never have to talk about yourself. It's other people talk about you, whether it's good, bad or indifferent. And and that's how I like it. If, if um, certain certain players will say, you know, they're the best players. But the, the one thing I do know about my game is defensively, I've locked down some of the best players in the world in my era. So I know when I played um, in the BBL, and, and this is what's changed now. We, I would have to guard the best offensive guard, but also have to score. So I'm giving, I'm giving you 25, but I'm also holding that guard down to below their average. And my toughest cover, because obviously Nick Nurse played back then, he played at Derby. My toughest cover was Chris Finch. And I'll never forget a triple overtime game in London Arena against Sheffield, who was supposed to be. We, we, we were winning. He must have had a big shot at the end to put into overtime. And Chris Finch would use the screens to a T. He was a, he was a shooter. So he would use he was running me off screen after screen after screen, and he just wore me down. And uh, we ended up losing by about two or four points. I had Roger Huggins, Andy Gardner, I think Ian McKinney, Jason Swain. I think I'm not too sure, but um, Chris Finch was one of the toughest covers because he just knew how to use the screens and move and work, and and it just wore me down. And I'll never forget that. Yes. Yeah, uh... On the history point, I, I said it so many times that, that I genuinely think that for us to have a, a true sort of English-British basketball culture, it starts with the history because then that gives you the context to everything else. And right now, we just we just don't. And, and like you said, like um, you know, you you don't you're not the kind of guy that's going to talk about yourself and talk yourself up and and you know post your stats or or whatever. And so you for it, for your stories to get out there, it requires media outlets like myself and, and other people. There's been quite a few actually lockdown podcasts that have started, which I thoroughly encourage uh, in the British basketball landscape because it means that more people are going to get spoken to, more stories are going to get documented. Um, and it's one of the things, like even talking to you, like obviously, you know, we've had a relationship for a few years now and I, yeah. I've always known that you're a legend of the game. 
but it's only when I've spent the time actually, you know, trawling through the pages of Google, going back and back and realizing, wow, like, you know, not only has he done this, but he's done this as well. And like, he was this and, and you just don't know these things um, until you really, you've got to dig to find it. And it's trying to make it, it needs to become uh, as accessible and and easily um searchable as as the nba you know i think it's ridiculous that we live in we live in another country but it's easier for me to write a piece about the nba in the 1960s than it is to write about <laughs> you know a a, a a player in my own country because the information exists there and, and here we just don't have it in a in a sort of digital format to make it um accessible which is why i, I love doing all these conversations because you just find out just so much stuff um yeah go on. I, I think as well i think some of the national team players that i've coached they they when they have when they want to know 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 about things to do with the states and issues whether they're uh, positive or negative they'll reach out to me in confidence and that's what I like because when you've been around them when they go to the states and because a lot of our youngsters that are in the states now they have uh, they've they've gone through similar things to myself and they don't have the support but now it's more isolation mental issues you know it could be cultural issues where's the support system and 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 that's a big issue with a lot of players and also i do speak to a few parents because you know they players will give a lot to their clubs the clubs will find them somewhere to go in the states and then that's it they'll say that they're monitoring them but they, they're not giving the parents and that player the support and well-being that they actually need so you know, if, if we can't get our history right, if we can't get our future right, and if we've got um, very fragmented, we, we've got all these little coaching groups, maybe players groups, um, this f philosophy is the best, this way is how we do it, this is what you should be doing, we're missing the point. The key is, it's about that player. How, you know, how, you know no X's and O's, no, no courses are going are gonna to help you to, you don't need that to go and speak to the player and say, okay, what's your background? Where are your parents from? What's their, what's your parents' history? You know, uh, have they suffered from any, any issues around race, creed, or color? Because this, you know, if we, we get deep into it, I still st suffer with, with racism at my age as a coach. And, and it's crazy. So if I'm still, if I, me as somebody who is a well standing person in the game, um, is is it affects me still now? Mm. What what are our younger generation? You know how is it affecting them? And just going back to a point you said about the states, um, I went back to the states for our thirtieth anniversary for the final four, and it's amazing. As soon as I get into Atlanta, it's they know more about me than people do here. You know, so you're 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 a star in in another in another country. So mm -hmm. it's about, it's not to say that I want people to bow down to me. It's not even about that, but it's about the respect of what you've given to the game, yeah. you know, and that's the difference between us and the States where we're about now. It's about, it's the millennials. I call it. I want, I want something now without working for, it, or I want to show that I'm this great person by just posting stuff, which is fine. But when you look deep behind it, what's actually there yeah. so i mean that that's just my little rant yeah, yeah no i know exactly yeah. what you're saying it's it's one of the things where it's like you know i 100 percent i want all of the young british players to recognize our history and know the the legends and the the crazy things that have happened before them to sort of set the context on the path that they're on but the other thing is that right now if you're one of those players if you're a 16 17 year old player that you know wants a professional basketball career and wants to be a, a future english basketball legend or whatever it's like how are you actually going to find out that information it's just it's just it's not accessible like if if you want to like you have to, you know, make phone calls, you know, speak to people directly. It's just, it's so difficult. And until, until that changes, until there is some type of, you know, people, there's been talk about a Hall of Fame for a long time in, in England and there's been, you know, other discussions about this and that. But until those things happen, it's, it's yeah, you know, it's, it's going to be incredibly yeah. difficult to change. So uh, I don't yeah, know, man. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, but it, it has to, I, I think another issue is, is it's about having the right people in place to do these things. Oh, of so, you know, you know, one of my, you know, my mentor, Kevin Cadle, bless him, who's passed away. We battled. He had me as a, as a player. And I always remember when I first started coaching, I had to call him and apologize. 
you know, we did a lot on Sky Sports as well. I called Kevin Kelly. I said, Kevin, I got to apologize. He's like, why? I said, now I can see how I was to you or with you as a player. And he just laughed. He said, now, now I've started coaching. I feel isolated and I can see how I was as a player. And it, 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 these are these are life things, you know. So, and he was always there if I needed to talk. He was always there, you know, if I wanted to run things by him. But until you go through, it's about experience. Until you go through things, that, that's one of the best ways of learning and then reflecting and speaking to other people about it and feeling secure. When you talk about your mentality as a player, would you say that you were, you know, just by things you've said in this conversation, uh, and there was there was actually an article I wanted to bring up it, that, I, that I dug up on Google from The Independent <laughs> um, about you getting suspended or potentially a suspension for a playoff semi-final and a playoff final with, when you're with Guildford with Kevin Cadle uh, for going at the referees. Like, would you say that, you know, in your, in your playing days, you're a bit of a hothead um, and kind of, you know, a bit temperamental like that? Like kind of, yeah. Do you remember that incident? Wow. You've done some, you, I forgot, you've done some, uh, some good <laughs> research. I always remember that. And it's, um, I think throughout my career, I've had, I've had things like that happen, but I've always learned. And I think it's it, it's me controlling my passion. I think we played against, it was Birmingham in the playoffs. And I think the playoffs back then, I think you played them three times, twice at home, once away. And it was a young referee, um, Richard Stokes, I'll mention him. Richard Stokes, it was. Who's now the, who's now the he, director of officiating at the Euro League. <laughs> yes, yes. And, um, and he'll remember this. And um, I think you had a lot of old. I think uh, somebody else. So I think Alan Richardson could have been refereed as well. Richard Stokes, young ref, cocky. I'm cocky, and he was making calls that I didn't like. And we won. I think we won the game, but I was just so frustrated at the calls, and I had it in my mind. I'm gonna go and see him. I'm gonna go into the locker room and and vent my frustrations to this re young referee. Who does he think he is? So this is me looking back, just being an idiot, highly strong, uh, taking what, taking stuff on the court, off the court, which, you know, some, you know, you know, it happens. And I, I went in there, gave him a piece of my mind and it wasn't good. And it, and it was 110% my fault. And, I think I missed the play. I missed uh, the playoff finals. I think I missed the play. I had to sit there because I had a two-game suspension. It was the second leg plus the playoff finals. And you know what? Uh, it was well deserved. But me and Richard Stokes are like we we laugh about it now, and we've not really we spoke about it many years ago. But that would have shaped his refing career as well because you you have these moments and we have a history. So I know I can call up Richard any time and he can call me and uh, everything's fine. So, yeah, that, that, that was some good research there. <laughs> wow. Put me on the spot. Do you, do you... Don't do it. I wouldn't, exp I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want anybody to do that. The refs are always right. Remember that. <laughs> I was going to say, like, uh, you know, hearing you speak now, it's clear that you've obviously mellowed out quite a lot. Like, how do you think that transition happened? Do you think it's just with age and experience and you kind of learn from these things? Or, or was it was there a particular incident? Like, what do you attribute that to? I think you know something. I'm coaching now, but sometimes you 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 do lose it sometimes with the coaches. But you you have to you, you know reframe, and you you you've got to you know rein it in. I think it's it's with experience and it's with reflection because you're never too old to learn and reflect. Nobody's perfect, so I just think um, refs are there; they're part of the game. And a lot of players are passionate and you, and you don't mean to do it. It's just your passion inside. It just shows you how much you want it and how badly you want it. And I think that's why coaches always wanted me on their teams because they knew what they were going to get. I would run through a brick wall for you. I'm going to play um, uh, 40 minutes, 80 minutes, 90 minutes. I'm going to give you everything I've got. So, and leave it out on the floor, you know, and, and I think that's, that's the one thing I learned because when you grew up with nothing and you've had to fight for something your whole life, you, you always, you never want to lose something. You're always scared of losing something. So, you know, it's just my passion and some people will take it in the wrong way, but you know, so be it. When you look back on, 
on your BBL days, kind of what are your favourite memories that stand out? Oh, my, my, well, everything. I think the, the, the best thing, best times for me were with the Leopards when um, we were sponsored by Planet Hollywood. And if we won, if we won a home game, we'd eat for free at Planet Hollywood and we could take our friends. So you better believe every home game, I always remember players were driving down from Birmingham, as far as Birmingham, <laughs> Leicester, coming to, our games, <laughs> yeah, coming to our games and hoping we'd win. So afterwards, we'd have about 50 people in Planet Hollywood just eating. The bill must have been horrendous. And um, and that only lasted one season. And after that, that season, they, they gave us vouchers. So we couldn't bring so many players. So, you know, playing for the Leopards, that was a great uh, a great journey. Playing with Guildford Kings, you know, uh, bless Adrian coming to, you know, passed away at a young age. Um, Carl Miller, we had, we, we had great teams there. Uh, also playing with um, London Towers, you know that was great. And I just, I just felt the BBL then. If you went and played in Manchester, it, it, it was more of a family because you would, you'd probably stay in Manchester whether you won or lost with one of your team, one of the players that you played against because you've known each other for years. So I, I felt there's more of a camaraderie, but you could do that because there was more money within the league yeah. and players were making a lot more money. So plus it was sponsored by. Budweiser, so you'd get a case. Everybody'd get a case of beer after the game, so that helped. <laughs> of course, always not, need a, not case. a great advert, but yeah, <laughs> not a great advert, but it was good at the time. The the other thing I I did want to ask about was was the stint in, in Italy. You know, you you did spend all of your career in in the UK, apart from this little this little stint in Italy, which I don't even think was a full season because I, I see on your career records uh, that same season you're also in the BBL. So I don't know whether it was short lived or whether you did a full season there. Kind of what was the situation? What what happened in Italy? So so what happened was, and this goes back to only having seven All Star appearances reason I only had seven, I think seven or eight or nine, whatever it was, um, was the, um, uh, the when European players could come in, what the do you Bos- call it? Bosman the Bosman ruling. ruling. Yeah. So what it was, we were we were supposed to have an all-star game. We we as English players, we uh, we wanted all the English players to boycott the all-star game because it was on TV because we didn't want the Bosman ruling. A lot of people don't realise this. So I was always on the forefront of the Players Association with Mark Robinson, and we wanted to, we didn't want five Americans, because that's taken away from our jobs, because what owners would do, the American players are cheap, and us as English players were making more than the Americans, so for what we were making as English players, you could get one or two Americans, or sometimes three, for what they were paying us, so we boycotted, we didn't want the Bosman ruling, because you could have five Americans, and then, or how many Europeans, and then our English talent wouldn't be you wouldn't see them prominent in the bbl so obviously that didn't work you know we got blackboard for for um doing that for which were the players um, that were involved with that um i think um steve bucknell i think uh, i don't know if ronnie was involved i think there was there was quite a few english players that did that 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 boycotted the uh, all-star game but what they did they brought ringers in and um uh, to take our place, there, there was a few players I think that boycotted. So Not you actually sure. you, you were actually selected as all stars and you decided to sit out in protest. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. We, Do you know what season that, that was? Mm, uh, probably it's probably the season, my the last season of my all stars. I think okay. I'm not too sure, but it was it was the season, season before the Bosman, Bosman ruling came in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Out. So but so when the Bosman ruling came in, I I went over to a lot of Spanish clubs. Uh, Verona in Italy. I, I went to a lot of uh, clubs trying out, and then I think Gorizia came up from A2 to A1, and they signed me. But because it was, we came up from A2, we didn't have we didn't have a good American. So I didn't know coming into the team as a Bosman player, they were trying to treat me like an American player. So you had an um, uh, Italian international, you had me as an England international, and an American. And I was scoring more than the American. So I'm like, well, I'm not the American player. I should be like a homegrown player. So halfway through the season, I was getting uh, calls from England about coming back to play. And I wasn't enjoying it in Italy. We weren't winning. The team didn't have that much money. I didn't know if I was going to get, because I was getting you know decent money there. 
I didn't know if they were going to honor uh, my my contract. So what I did, I made sure that I had a I had to get out, and I said to him, "Look, I want to go back to England." So what I made sure that they paid me first, then I went instead of them not paying me. So I think I played half a season, and then I went back to England. And and the thing was, playing in England, I was making more than playing in Europe. But then you had to. But it's the best thing I did because coming back to England, that's when I started to focus on okay, what am I? What do I want to do after basketball? Because I know a lot of players that played all over Europe, made a lot of money, finished playing, but didn't have anything to come back to and lost a lot of money. So for me, it worked in my favor to come back, set up my uh, cave in the community, uh, my my stuff within the community, my mentoring and things like that. So it was something that was a blessing in disguise, to be fair. For context, obviously, if you don't want to answer this, you don't have to answer this, but I think it's interesting. Uh, how much as a top player, top, top ranked British player in the BBL could you earn as a salary? Like when we're talking about amounts, I mean, you don't have to give me specifics, but can you give me roundabout figures so that people kind of know how much you could earn well, in the BBL? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, okay? It was more than the London Raw's budget, and they went bust. So the players from London Raw's were making a certain amount of money. It was more money than that what they were making, and it was sustainable. But the problem was you had the lower clubs, because we I was on the Players Association. So you had, you had the lower clubs who didn't want those us to be making that much money because they said there was a disparity. But we're we're trying to make a living. Our, our, if you look at our careers aren't are long. Some of the owners are still there making money to this day. So I would say it was a lot more than what uh, the London Royals budget was and what they were working with. And what you got to remember as well is what the BBL's done now. They've cut the league short. Remember the league. We were getting paid. August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. The season was 10 months. So we had training in August. Season was starting September and the players were in May. So we would get paid for 10 months. Right. Okay. So you... So, so what, yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah, go on. Yeah. yeah so, so whilst you were in the BBL, you were still... With, you, were, you were sort of set up your your KB in the community and that's kind of like I did want to get on to uh, the founding of the Le- Leicester Warriors which was was what 2003 was wow. that I'm pretty it sure was it was two, it was around 2003 and you retired so you retired uh, 2002 2003 was your last season with with the Riders yeah. so literally yeah. the season that you the season that you retired straight away you'd launched uh, Leicester Warriors which but you'd already no. been doing stuff in the community like tell me the timelines how did yeah. it work so, so what happened? So, the history of Leicester Warriors. Leicester Warriors is uh, the the club itself is uh, twenty five. It's uh, over twenty five years old. Okay. Twenty five years. But did you? So did you how found, it started? I would. No, no. How it started was, it was a group of my friends. It was a uh, the first um, black local league team in the city of Leicester. So it was a group of group of my friends yeah. who were who were playing in my old school Moat Boys up in a little gym, and they used to just gather and play. And uh, it, it, first of all, it was called it was called uh, uh, it was called Red Star, and it and that was a football club. And then the guy who was who was who was supporting it, he had to go away on a holiday for a little while, and uh, some of my friends. They just kept it going. So how I got involved was the team was always winning the local league, but none of the players wanted to pay subs. So they're winning the local league every year, winning the cup, getting the abuse, the only black team in in, in, the, in Leicestershire. And um, one of my good friends comes to me. I'm, I'm walking in town and I bumped into him. It was a Friday afternoon. I always remember it was a, a, a hot summer's afternoon. And he goes, he goes, KB. I says, what? He said, um, man, we're, we're going to have to fold the Warriors. I said, why? He said, nobody's paying subs. You don't have any money. I said, well, I can help you. What, what needs doing? He says, uh, I, I don't know. But, you know, if you could take it on and help. I said, okay, I'll help. So 
what I did, I did my research, got had to, got the constitution, looked at all the things that they were doing from before. None of the players would they'll just show up, play the game, not really pay any subs, no bank account. So I met this lady who was helping me with some community stuff because I'm transitioning from playing, doing a bit of coaching, doing because uh, I was always coaching within the community, giving back. And she said, these are the types of things you need to do in order to for the club to work. She, she talked about infrastructure and, and various other bits. And I said, well, it's, it's just a local league team. What I'd like to do is I want to work with the youth in my area because parents were complaining that there was nothing for their kids to do because no coaches wanted to come and coach in the inner city because they would. I, I heard this from some coaches that the inner city kids are too hard to deal with. And I took offense to that. So that's how the, the, the Warriors was already going before that. But I took it on and started with three kids in my development program and an assistant coach who was 16 and he thought I was crazy. And I always remember the three kids were my two nephews and one of my friend's sons in my first session in my old school. And it was about, and how it started was about, so let's, let's if we lose, use London, for instance, you got Brixton and Stockwell. So they're, they're warring against each other in gangs. So I set up a club in Brixton, a club in Stockwell. Uh, every couple of weeks, we would come and play a game, a game against each other. And it was ultimate chaos. But they were both Stockwell, um, Stockwell Warriors and Brixton Warriors. So they realized that they were the same teams. But what I did do was um, set up in two different areas. And I bought in this primary school from a white, out, white country area to play in a tournament. So there was these two inner city areas, all black and Asian kids, dual heritage kids. And it's one school, all white kids and one Asian kid. And they whooped both our teams. And I wanted that to happen. And at the end of it, we had a conversation. Say, look, we're all part of one family. And it, and that was the starting of um, the Warriors Junior Development Program many, many years ago. Wow. So so now, like, uh, kind of, what were the, what? well, I guess, what, what are the current aspirations with, with the club? Like, you know, obviously you're competing in National League now and doing, you know, at various different levels. Um is that is that kind of you you want I, I feel like it's always been very much community focused at the grassroots level doing stuff yeah. you know with with the kids is that always been going to be the focus or do you have aspirations to think oh maybe Leicester one day could support another BBL club like is that even on the radar or are you like you know I'll leave riders to do that and I'll just focus on what I've got here I, I think what it is we um we're about community there's not too many you know when you look at it and you ask there's a lot of teams a lot of clubs there's there's not in the country, and you, you could research this, there's not too many community clubs in the community. And what a classic community club is, is you're embedded in the community. You know, your people are from the community. You, It's not just about basketball. It's about food delivery. It's about if, you know, people have issues with paying their bills. If they're, if you know, if somebody's been, you know, it's like London, you know, there's a lot of knife crime. You know, kids will stab other kids, you know, the cuffs of drugs so we're more than just just basketball and for us we're about the development of young people so we've had um players that have come to our club like other clubs so we're we're, we're, we're not special um like the elliot sentences and the and the Raphael thomas edwards they've come through our club they've gone on to the states and you know they've come back to play for us and then they go on and play bbl and that's what i love love about the guys that have gone away to the States, they'll come back. If they don't have a BBL club or they're, they're trying to figure out what they're doing, they'll give back to us and then they'll go and find their career somewhere else. So we're about the, the, the Warriors, KB, it's about community. It's about family. And, you know, if we've got a player that has aspirations to become a professional, we also have that infrastructure. So we could, because we have the link. So all you got to look at is Kareem Queeley came to us at 10 years old, you know, played for us for four years, four seasons, um, averaging 70, 80, 90 points a game. We could have kept him until he was 16, 17, like a lot of clubs did. But, you know, Real Madrid and a couple of other clubs wanted him. We made sure that for 
we monitored him and his mom. We was I was with them every step of the way, and our club was with them every step of the way. So because his mom didn't want him to go, he's you know thirteen years old going over to a foreign country, and we had to gain her trust. We had to gain his trust, but we navigated it well. We made sure, you know, as a stakeholder, his mom and Kareem and his dad, they, if they said something, it had to go. If they didn't want to do something, it didn't happen. I was just there from a basketball standpoint. And that's what I said to his, his, his mom and dad. The, the parental side, you guys deal with it. I'm here to guide you basketball-wise because, as you know, a lot of ple- a lot of clubs would sell your pipe dream. They couldn't they couldn't um, do that with myself and our club. So, you know, Cream's now signed professionally in Borgas. He's in St. Kitts right now. So we have different players that have gone on to university, gone on to be professionals, but we still keep our, our community base. And that's what our coaches want as well. Well, on the on the topic of Kareem, like how early did you know did you realise how, how good he was? Like I'll you know, for me, like I remember when he was 12 and I was getting these messages being like, there's this kid in Leicester who's, you know, scoring flipping ridiculous amounts of points. I think he had a 90 point game at some point, an 80 yeah. point game, um, just putting up stupid numbers. Uh, was his talent evident from, from the start or, or what? Well, I mean, if you started playing at 10, like it was pretty early, but, but still kind of, yeah. When did you know, what were your memories there? Um, well, Kareem, he, Arbam coached him. And uh, a coach named uh, Denley Andrews, they coached him when he was uh, about 10, I think about 10 years old. And he was a football player. So he was playing football and he came to one of our practices and he didn't have any basketball shoes. He had football socks. And and, and, and this is uh, and this will be him to tell his story when he gets older. He I think the coach wanted to cut him because he wasn't that good when he was playing. And uh, he, he, we didn't see him for about a month. Then he came back, he grew, and he he went away and worked on his game. And I always remember it was the summer uh, when he was, I think he was just going to become 12, I think he's 11 or 12, and we had a coaches meeting. And um, one of the coaches says, yeah, Kareem's growing, we're going to play him inside. I'm like, no. I said, I'm looking three to four years down the line, all our players, he needs to be working on his guard skills. Because what if he doesn't grow? Because you see it all the time. A kid six foot, coaches stick them inside. When they get to 14, 15, they're still six foot. They've got no guard skills. So all summer, me and the coaches we, and, and Kareem, he worked on his guard skills. And it was amazing that any time re- he grabbed a rebound in a game, he was the biggest guy on the court dribbling it up. And the biggest guy was behind him who was guarding him. So people couldn't figure out, well, wait a minute. Why is this guy handling the ball playing outside? They thought, it was unnatural, but the bigger picture was that I was looking, I think he could be a decent player. And what I did as well, because I was involved in the national team program with uh, Simon Fisher, and I called Alan Keane. And I said to Alan, I said, Alan, I've got this player, but I don't know if it's me, but you know, somebody else needs to take a look at him. And he said, well, Jesse's doing the under 14s, you know, get, get him to try and go to uh, one of the, one of the training camps. So obviously I sent an email, uh, Jesse had him and, and um, Jesse cut him uh, his first year, but he's on, he was 11 playing under 14s. He was skinny. You know, it, they were too physical for him. Best thing that ever happened to him because driving home with the coach, he was crying all the way back home that he got cut. And then the next year is history. Wow. So, you know, with Kareem, he, he, you know, he's a generational player, like a Lawal Deng. I mean, yeah, like the, I think when we talk about the greatest, obviously Kareem's career is still very much being played out. But when, yeah. when we talk about the greatest junior players to have played in the UK, what yeah. Kareem did as, you know, winning the yeah. Mini Copa MVP as an under 13. And those highlights are still on that ECB's YouTube channel, which got like 50,000 views or whatever. So, uh, you know, yeah. I encourage people to go look them up. It was just ridiculous. Um, when, you know, I was going to just briefly, I'm aware of time, but just briefly, mm. you were involved with, with the England national team set up for a long time with uh, and coaching, you know, two, you were involved with coach staff of two very good generations, the 95s, which is obviously your Luke Nelsons, your, your Mo Shodawades, Kingsley, um, and all that crew. And then also the 93s, which is, you know, Devin Van Oostrum, Jesse Chuku, all those guys. Like when you're talking about 
the greatest junior players that you've seen, you've been around? Uh, who are some of the names that you would drop? Who are the guys that stick out wow. in, in your mind? Why, why are you putting me on the spot? Well, <laughs> I think for, for me, um, Devon, uh, obviously, is from Sheffield when he played. And uh, when I got involved with Simon, I I always try and do my research. And my cousin at the time played for Sheffield Sharks. And I said, I keep hearing about this Devon Van Oostrom. He's a really good player. But, you know, I keep hearing that he doesn't listen to coaches. He said, no, that's not the case. This is how you need to approach him. So right from the beginning, myself and Devon, we had that mutual respect. And he just wanted to win. I think sometimes he's misunderstood. But I never had a problem with him. He's one of the... Uh, one of the first players who I've seen that had a quadruple double. He had like, I don't know, 20, it's just European championships. Probably had like 20, about 29 points. He had like 12 assists. He had about 10 rebounds. He had about 12 turnovers. So, so, and, um, but Devon Van Oostrom, definitely. Obviously, I think um, definitely Kareem uh, as a junior. I think uh, Kane Henry, uh, uh, as as a junior is another one. Um, Rowell Graham as another one. He you know he, he was great. Luke Nelson for me, all time clutch player because you know uh, winning, winning uh, well not winning but getting promoted and winning silver medals and uh, a bronze medal. Luke Nelson was was very instrumental. You know uh, he he was our go to guy. Another one who is underrated is a. Uh, Kingsley Okora, uh, definitely. Also liked uh, Mo, but also somebody who, who um, uh, Josh Ward Hibbert. If he'd have stayed playing, he would have been one of our top players. He had to choose uh, to to play tennis, but he would have been one of our all time uh, great junior players. I've probably missed some other players out, but I think those guys that that I've worked with so far, they they were were really good. And then removing the the junior from it, if I was to push you on your uh, all-time British greats, you know, guys that you've been around, guys that you've seen, or maybe guys that came before you that you just heard legendary stories about, kind of, who are the who are the names that that, that that's come to mind? Well, le- legendary for me was Gene Waldron from Syracuse, Lonnie Leggett, um, Clyde Vaughan, uh, Kenny Pemberton, Marty Head. There's a there's a um, Ronaldo Lawrence. Well, a lot of people don't realize about Andrew Lawrence's dad. I think he still holds the scoring record of seventy three points. I think in 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 I, the league. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. He might still. Yeah, I would assume he still holds it. He's, if not, he's, he's he's up there. Yeah. Yeah, and our connection is Coach Kremich coached him as well. So I think from the era before me, but for me, you know, if I had to pick my all star five to play with, or well, some of my players uh, nationally, internationally, you got the Martin Henlands, you got the Ronnie Bakers, obviously Steve Bucknell, Peter Scannerbury, uh, Richard Scannerbury, uh, uh, Trevor Gordon. So uh, that's but to name a few. Uh, Mark Hubbard. So uh, even uh, John Bunnell. So people that I've played with, there's so much history and you're putting me on the spot because there's going to be... Uh, people that I forget, but there's so much of a rich international history of, um, you know, when Kevin Cadle coached us and we beat Russia to in, in Manchester. Uh, and I think that was the first time, uh, one of the first times that a, a national, English national team beat Russia on home soil. And this was for us to go to, to progress in the European Championships. So that was a great night. So there's so many memories, you know, we could talk for hours, but it, it, and, that, and that's the thing with history. That's the beauty of history. You know, looking at, you know, we didn't talk about the last dance, but looking at Michael Jordan's documentary, I remember wherever I was and what I was doing, but it make, it resonates with me how great he was and, you know, what he had to go through. Yes, it, it, his style may not be conducive to everybody, but he's a winner and, you know, everything that he's done speaks for itself. When you talk about your playing legacy, you know how how do you want to be remembered? When people talk about the Carl Brown of of of, 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 <laughs> of playing days, kind of, uh, what do you think people will be saying? And what do you what would you how would you like to be remembered? Well, I don't know what they'll be saying, but how I would like to be remembered is that I I think simply I, I left everything everything on the court. You know, I know a lot of people have a lot of stories, 
But um, I think the one the one thing for me with my players and players that knew me, I was always loyal. Loyalty was always key, and I always gave you a hundred percent, left it on the floor. But um, for 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 me, it's what people will think. But I just want to be remembered as somebody that didn't cheat the game. Perfect. Cool. That's a super nice place to leave it. KB, thank you so much for taking the time. It's much appreciated. It was awesome. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. And hopefully we'll get to catch up again sometime soon. Oh, no, definitely, man. Thanks a lot. <laughs>